This week on Q&A, Fortune Magazine's senior editors-at-large Alan Sloan and Jeff Colvin discuss their recent cover story about their solutions for improving America's economy. Alan Sloan, you and Jeff Colvin, in uh, the early part of September in Fortune Magazine, did a piece that was transferred to the Washington Post and had a big headline on it, Enough Already. Was that a good headline for what you wrote? I think so. What uh, was it? What was the well, point? Well, well, Jeff and I, who are as opposite as people can possibly be, have both been endlessly annoyed at watching no sign of progress anywhere in Washington uh, on anything, on fiscal, tax, anything. And our boss, Andy Serwer, who runs Fortune, decided that since there wasn't going to be anything resembling intelligent economic conversation, that he would commission the people he calls Fortune's on couple to propose solutions. So we just sat down and wrote it. Jeff Coleman, how did you go about it? Yeah, it was pretty simple. Alan and I decided the smart thing here is get off the premises. Two of us went a couple blocks down 6th Avenue in New York and had lunch just by ourselves. And we just went through the big issues here. And we found that, you know what, even though we don't agree, and as Alan said, you know, we're, we come from opposite perspectives here. We were able, in a short time, to reach general agreement on a few principles that were the biggest and most important ones. And, you know, the larger point here is that within Washington, and look, a lot of people know it, but a lot of people don't, within Washington, there is broad agreement on what the financial problems of the country are, broad agreement on the solutions, and there seems to be broad agreement that nothing can be done. It's the most insane situation you can imagine, but that seems to be it. All right, how do you two differ? What's your political <laughs> background or thinking? <laughs> well, look, we, we may as well come out here. We didn't, uh, we didn't do it in the piece. You know, we, it's carefully written, so you can't tell which one leans which direction. But let's just put it this way. The way we're seated here is pretty much the opposite of the way we actually are. I am not to the left of Alan, and believe me, he is not to the right of me. It's pretty much the reverse. What about on economics? What are your basic thoughts on uh, how do you get to your own position? My, my, you know, I'm a recovering English major, and I never studied economics, and I was cast out into the world to write about business and economics by accident. So I just went out and tried to learn with, with no preconceptions, with no anything, with no courses, with no graduate degree. And, and, but I can add and subtract. I mean, I'm not trying to steal a line from Clinton, but I can add and subtract. And it's not that hard if you just do that. And I don't have preconceptions. I don't love people. I don't hate people. I don't hang out with the Federal Reserve people or, or the opposite of the people. I just wander around through life trying to figure it out. Well, are you a Keynesian? Are you a follower of Hayek? I mean, it, 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 a couple of important points here. First of all, what economists will tell you is that for the most part, they agree on 98% of economics. And I think that's correct. Um, it's the 2% that they don't agree on where all the you know, important policy decisions have to get made. Frankly, you know, I, I am not much of a Keynesian. You know, I'll tell you uh, that. There which, are certain- Which means for the simplest way. Yeah, for, the, for those who are not paying a lot of attention to economics, which is fine. Um, <laughs> it, you know, it, it means I am um, something closer to the monetary, what we used to call the monetarist view, um, something closer to the, uh, you know, Austrian school, although I'm not all the way in that camp. But it is, it's not the Keynesian school. So, but if you're... Oh, you in, mean what's it mean? What's yeah, like what's the practical mean? meaning? Yeah, what is uh, it? Well, look, it has a very strong practical meaning right now, which is, was the, sti was the $700 X billion dollar stimulus program a good idea? Because the Keynesians would say, yes, absolutely, it just wasn't enough. The other side, the Austrians or the monetarists would say, no, it was not a good idea and it's just not going to work. And so, you know, my view would be, I don't think it was a very good idea. And uh, uh, Alan and I would disagree oh. violently on this. I assure you, he'll get his <laughs> chance. Um, but uh, that, that's the practical meaning of it in today's environment. How do you disagree? Well, I think we needed to do something to stimulate the economy. I don't think we needed to do what we did. I, I would have done it, and you know, if you had made me king and, and also given me power to just do what I wanted. I would have 
done in, instead of subsidizing public employee jobs. Not that there's anything wrong with that, since many of my friends are public employees. But, but that was a big part of the stimulus. I would have started all sorts of construction. I would have tried to finish that tunnel from New Jersey where I live, the railroad tunnel into New York, which would be of huge value all over the region. I would have done it differently. I, and, and again, since I don't have a degree in economics and don't want one, wouldn't take it if they gave it to me, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I was just trying to apply common sense and common sense was we needed to do something to shock the system, which is what I call pragmatic economics. But I don't think we did the right thing, but it was better than nothing. And Jeff probably disagrees, but we, didn't, we weren't writing about stimulus, we so it doesn't matter. We have this long <clears throat> article on our website so that people can access the fortune piece. But let me just start out the, the first, set the mood as you write. America's leaders aren't leading and the damage is mounting. Citizens have complained for years about Washington's squabbling children who'd rather stamp their feet and hold their breath and resolve mon uh, moment, mo momentous issues. I can't even <laughs> speak, you know, yeah. get, we got us all babbling. Well, you're short moment, of words momentous time, issues, yeah. uh, thank you, of economic <laughs> policy. The games are childish, but the resulting suffering is serious. Pick it up from there. Yeah. W what did you try? I named nine things that you wanted to change yeah. after the election. Yeah, that's exactly right. We are in a situation that we really haven't been in before, which is we are facing fiscal disaster. And that's not an overdramatic term. You can look at these charts. They're easy to find online. I encourage people to just do a little search. Congressional Budget Office, Treasury. You don't have to go to extremist groups. These, we are facing fiscal disaster disaster. The, the debt of the United States, the budget of the United States, on its current trajectory, is going to bankrupt the country if we don't do something. What's the worst thing that can happen? Well, the worst thing that can happen is what almost happened last summer when the idiots, primarily, I have to say, the Republican idiots, decided that, well, we can have the country default on its debt. That'll be fine. A and if you've ever been a banking reporter, which I have, and if you know how the banking system works, if there's anything resembling a default on U.S. debt, it is a disaster worldwide. And I, I thought we had learned something from that a year ago, but apparently we haven't. The worst thing that happens is the U.S. defaults on its debt. I mean, it would be catastrophic for no reason, for idi idiotic political reasons. What, it's what, crazy. What, what results from that? Well, I, I mean, first that happens is every bank in the United States, every major bank is bankrupt. I mean, be, because suddenly its capital is gone because there's a lot of capital tied up in, in government securities. So what happens if I go into the bank and I want my money? Well, you know, the FDIC might or might not still be there, but I mean, it's not like the banks would all close, but they wouldn't be able to lend. It's the same thing we had four years ago where you were facing massive bank failures. And, you know, you would still get your money from the FDIC, but you wouldn't be able to get a loan. Your, your company, there, you, you know, company might not have been able to pay you because it wouldn't be able to borrow. Companies couldn't, the soundest companies in the world couldn't borrow money. But there's not enough money in the FDIC, is there? For this thing well, really probably, no, of that's course right. not. The, the, of course not. not. We're talking trillions of dollars. Right. You know, I'm not saying that if the United States defaulted tomorrow, Bank of America and City and Wells Fargo would, would all, and, and would all, J.P. Morgan would all close their doors and go out of business. But it would be a serious, serious hit to commerce or what remains of commerce and lending and economic activity. Yeah. It's crazy. Jeff Coleman. Yeah, and, and the, the sort of larger problem here is we need to make very substantial changes in the tax and budget regime we have in the United States. Very serious changes that are going to hurt. And so nobody wants to do it. And the worst thing that can happen is we don't do any of them until we have a crisis, a really horrible crisis. And defaulting on the debt would be pretty bad if it were allowed to happen for more than a day or two. Uh, but a horrible crisis could happen in other ways as well. For example, and this is something we really have to pay more attention to, uh, the previous 10 uh, leaders of the Council of Economic Advisors, maybe it was more than 10, from both parties 
last year jointly signed a letter, an open letter to Congress and the administration, saying, look, if we don't get this situation under control, what's going to happen is one day, and no one knows when it's going to be, but, but for sure one day, the bond market, all the people and institutions in the world that lend those billions of dollars to the United States are going to start demanding a higher interest rate. It'll go up and up and up. And when it does, what they said was, we will have a financial crisis that will make the 2008 financial crisis look small. And that's the real danger. One quick thing. Uh, Alan Sloan took a whack at the Republicans. Yes. Is that fair? <laughs> well, look, in these negotiations, you always have to give the impression that you're willing to go right up to the edge and over it. It's the same in labor negotiations or any other kind of negotiation. What you're really willing to do, no one ever knows until the final moment. And in this course, in this case, of course, when it came to the final moment, the default was averted. So I, I tend not to blame either side. It's a negotiation, and I blame them both because they couldn't come up with a solution earlier. Let's go to some of the solutions you have. You proposed a number of changes that could occur after yeah. the election. And, yes. and to start off here, you say, we could restrict the end-of-life care that Medicare will right. pay for. Right. <clears throat> How can you restrict the end-of-life care? You just adopt rules, and that's just what you do. I, I mean, I'm not going to tell you specifics because I don't know them, but I can tell you that, that I and Jeff and I suspect many of the people watching this, and I'm guessing from your age, you have seen what happens Thanks, when Andy. people you love get old and sick <clears throat> right. and end up in the hospital right. using vast amounts of money, you know, because hospitals are expensive and it's the end of life and, and they're not going to make it and they're not going to have a life, but an enormous amount of money is expended. It, it's huge. And it's the thing everybody knows and nobody will talk about it because who wants right. to talk about Why that? Why do you go for that, Jeff Coleman? Uh, same reason. It, it accounts for a huge proportion of total Medicare spending. And by the way, one reason it's the first thing in our uh, article here is getting Medicare costs under control is the number one priority. And it's the most untouchable thing. But that is going to cause more trouble than any other problem we've got fiscally in the United States. Getting Medicare costs under control is the number one thing. You say we'd also surcharge smokers yep. and the obese yep. for their Medicare coverage. Right. Where'd that idea come from? Well, it came from us. It came, I mean, I'm, I'm the person who put it in the memo, but I didn't have to fight very hard for it. Right. Also, I had a... I ran into this in something I ran in the Washington Post, where instead of calling people morbidly obese, I called them mega fatties. And I was rebuked for this by the Washington Post Ombudsman for being insensitive, which I guess I probably am. Um, but it, this is another thing where everybody knows this to be true, and someone has to pay for it. I, I'm not saying you should bankrupt people if they're too heavy, but you know there should be penalties. I, I mean, I'm. I'm not really a Democrat, but I'm certainly a Democrat compared to him. But you have to be responsible to some extent for your personal behavior. And if you're not going to pay, and someone's got to pay for it. Uh, quite right. And we should point out also that we're not the only ones making arguments like this. There have been these other bipartisan commissions and so forth. The task force that was headed by Alice Rivlin and Pete Domenici, a Democrat and a Republican, also said that with regard to Medicare, uh, we need to do something about the obese and smokers. And they also had a proposal, which was more complicated than ours, for restricting the spending on end-of-life care. By the way, these are difficult, painful decisions, but we're going to have to face them. Well, take the obese thing. Would you say that if you weighed X pounds over what the normal weight is for your size, well, that the, the Medicare is, would cut it off? This is why the Lord created experts. I am not an expert. I am not going to draw the line. I am skinnier than I was, but I'm no sylph. I, I'm not going to say what it is because I don't know. Yeah, you know, the, the, a way to think about this is that insurance companies manage to handle this kind of thing. In other words, it is feasible. You know, they will give you a medical exam before they'll sell you certain kinds of insurance. And they'll look at your weight, your heart rate, your blood sugar, and a million other things and use it to set your rate. Well, okay, we can do this. I mean, it's feasible.
you say that Social Security should be a pay-as-you-go system yeah. wiping out the deceptive Social Security trust fund. What, yeah. What's that? Yeah. Uh, anytime, here, here's something to keep in mind, just in general. Anytime anybody mentions to you the Social Security trust fund, unless they're telling you that it's meaningless, which it is, then they're probably leading you astray. Why is it okay. meaningless? It's meaningless because the Social Security trust fund by law must be invested in U.S. Treasury securities. So it means that when the Social Security trustees go to the Treasury to redeem one of their Treasury bonds, they hand it to the Treasury, say, we'd like our money, please. The Treasury gives them the money and then goes out into the world to borrow it because otherwise they don't have it. What so it's you, just more government borrowing. What, Alan Sloan, what would you do about it? Well, <clears throat> what I would do is what we proposed in there, and I have spent years covering Social Security. I have angered any number of people by writing what Jeff just said, and I've written it for 10 years, that the Social Security Trust Fund has moral significance but no financial value. And what I would do is what we proposed in there, basically pay out over maybe 25 or 30 years the balance in the Social Security Trust Fund to Social Security recipients, and in 25 years, you'd have a system that the money coming in would be about equal to the outgo, which is the way it used to be before 1982. And I don't want to bore you with the details because we'll lose all what remains of the audience. <laughs> but it is a pay-as-you-go system. Right. And it's got this trust fund, right. which is a weird economic thing having to do with Social Security's rules, but has no economic value and has led people astray. So let's just get rid of it as a distraction. It's already a pay-as-you-go system. Let's just call it what it is and then make it work on that basis. Let's see if we can get some advice from both of you. Uh, for people who are watching this election, yeah. what is absolutely going to happen after November the 6th? <laughs> absolutely <laughs> going to happen, no matter who's elected, yeah. that will have to do with people's pocketbook and the money? It's a great question. Um, no, well, matter, no matter, by the way, no yeah, matter what yeah, no the matter candidates what the say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, huh. That's a very good question. Um, I think what we can say with confidence is that the winner, whoever he may be, is going to have to do some stuff that will make him very unpopular. And the reason I say that is that we face this debt and deficit situation that is simply unsustainable. And frankly, next year, is the big window we've got right after the election you know the first year for it's either going to be romney's first year or it's going to be obama you know in the last thing he'll he will never run for re-election again so he won't have to worry about it um this is going to be their window to cut the budget in some significant way or at least have an outline for cutting the budget and reform the tax system in some kind of significant way. The, the question is, will it be the big picture reforms we need, or is it going to be a 12-month solution? But they're going to have to do something that's going to hurt. I hate to say that. But everybody? It is hurt everybody? Yeah. Darn near. It may be that... that and yeah, will it hurt the upper income people? Probably so. In fact, I think that's inevitable. The, the only re reason I would hesitate is probably at the very bottom of the income scale, um, care will be taken to make sure they are not hurt. What would you say to somebody watching the election, listening to the candidates, they all promise that you elect me and everything's going to be fine. Yeah. <clears throat> that happened, uh, what, four years ago? It happened two years ago, and there's been, it's and gotten it happened, worse and worse. And it happened eight years ago, and 12 mm -hmm. years ago, right. and 14 okay. years ago. And the answer is everyone isn't going to be fine. What I hope is going to happen is that we'll have what I've been calling, again, for 15 years, shared sacrifice. Everyone will sort of suck it up and grow up, you know, in enough already, and we'll cut some of these programs, or, you know, cut the growth, and we'll increase the tax revenue to the government, and will act like a civilized society with sharing the pain instead of this fantasy that I can have what I want and everyone else is going to pay for it. All right, let me just knock down another one of your yeah. ideas here. Knock, not knock it down, yeah, yeah. bring it on the table. Cross it off. The largest element of spending after 
Social insurance right. is defense. Right. It's budget can and should be cut. Yes. Now you're yes. conservative. Yes. And I think I've heard Mr. Romney talk about the fact that we're not going to cut. Right. Right. Here's the reality, again, that has to be faced. And, you know, if you're running for office, I guess it's one of those things you can't say. But it still needs to be said. Yes, the defense, dep the, the defense budget is large and it needs to come down. Here's the, and, and again, if you're not running for office, then you can say all this stuff. Alan Simpson, a Republican, will be happy to tell you that it can and must come down. He points out that the U.S. defense budget is larger than the combined defense budgets of the next 14 largest countries in the world. Uh, it, what really struck me this year was the House in May passed an appropriations bill for defense. Okay, Were they looking to cut? No. In fact, they passed an appropriations that gives three or four billion dollars to the Pentagon more than what the Pentagon asked for. The Pentagon specifically wanted to cut back or reduce a drone program, a tank program, and a submarine program. The Defense Department said, we don't, okay, listen, we don't want these things. We don't need them. The House put them back. Okay, this is about, frankly, sending pork back to the district rather than addressing the country's fiscal needs. So yeah, the defense budget can be cut, and frankly, the Defense Department knows that and is ready for it. They Alan, just want it done in a, an intelligent, planned, orderly way. Alan Sloan, uh, the, the word sequester, I've had people say, what in the world does that <laughs> word mean? And people suggest that sequestering the defense budget over the next 10 years will be a disaster for our national security. Well, again, I don't pretend to know. Showing you, by the way, some of the dynamics here, the social, the, the cutbacks in Social Security and Medicare, the, the, those were things I threw into the pot at the first thing. Jeff is the guy who threw in the defense That's budget, right. which, frankly, I probably wouldn't have even thought of because right. it's so untouchable. Right. I mean, what will happen? I don't know. Do you understand how the military works? <laughs>
jointly said exactly this, broaden the base, lower the rates. We had the task force with Alice Rivlin and Pete Domenici that I mentioned earlier. Again, bipartisan. They said exactly this. In, in, in those words, broaden the base, lower the rates. But get to detail. What does that what mean? Do you, what does it mean? Very oh. simple. It means we get rid of all kinds of deductions, exemptions, credits, special breaks that are in the tax code today. We just get rid of a lot of them, and by doing so, we can then lower the tax rates that are applied to everybody else. What are the chances? Well, I mean, reality. Reality is if we have what I half expect will happen, which is a big crisis that scares everybody, including the zealots on both sides, though, again, I would argue the, the real zealotry is coming from the Republican Party, but many of the Democrats are no prizes, maybe everyone will grow up and do this. It's not our job to predict what will happen. That's not what we did. We wanted to say what should happen. And these are things, as Jeff says, everybody knows who has studied this seriously, but nobody wants to say whether it will or won't happen. I don't know. It should happen. And the, I think Alan gets to a very important point, which is fundamentally how bad a crisis will it take before the leaders in Washington can agree on a big um, compromise People of this type. People have been predicting in your line of work around the world that there is going to be a catastrophe. I mean, serious people with yeah. the following, that yeah. we are headed toward a catastrophe. Is that, yeah. is that possible? Of course it's possible. Or the question are. is, is it likely? And what kind of catastrophe is it? Look, Brian, I'm 67 years old. Okay, I've worked my whole life. I've saved. I've been thrifty. I've been a good boy. And no matter what happens, you know, I will survive, and my wife and I will survive financially. No matter but, what happens. Well, well, all right, if a meteor comes and kills everybody on Earth, I'll be dead. <laughs> yeah, people are suggesting that we're, I mean, our money's not going to be worth anything if right. a catastrophe hits us. Well, you see, that's the advantage of being 67. <laughs> Just take a pill. I, 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 mean, I mean, I'll take it with me out of spite. No, it's, it, it, you know, again, a lot of the, I'm not into apocalypse. You know, I've, I've studied religion. I'm not into apocalypse. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I think just like four years ago, where people got scared enough to do something, you could argue about whether we did the right things to save the system from collapse. They'll save the system from collapse the next time around as well. The, the, you know, but the only way to fix the thing and not have these recurring problems is to do the kinds of things that Jeff and I are talking about. The catastrophe is certainly possible. My own view is that it's unlikely. It's possible, but I think the probability is pretty low. And the greater probability is that we just go nowhere for a long, long time. That unemployment remains at a fairly high level, kind of like it is today. That economic growth remains at a slow rate, like it is today that living standards don't rise for some years into the future as they have not for the past several years. It's not a nice scenario, but frankly, I think it looks fairly likely. And it could be improved, though not, com not completely avoided, but it could certainly be improved by some bold big picture action. I want to come back to this in a moment, but first I want to find out wh where you who are from and how you got to where you are. Where, uh, Jeff Colvin, where did you start in life? Uh, I was born and raised in Vermilion, South Dakota, a wonderful place to be born and raised. I still say I was incredibly lucky to have uh, grown up where and when I did. Um, the family moved a little bit, but we were always Midwesterners. And um, What did I, your parents do? Uh, my, it was interesting. My uh, father owned a business, a printing business, uh, in South Dakota, and then in the middle of his career, he decided to change his career completely. He sold the business, uh, went back to school, got a PhD in clinical psychology, and the second half of his career was uh, on the faculty of a medical school um, in uh, Illinois. And my mother similarly uh, mostly worked at home uh, um, until the kids were out of college, at which point she went to law school, and the second half of her life was spent working as a lawyer. She practiced law. When did you leave South Dakota? Uh, we moved away from there when I was 14 years old. Um, and I finished high school in uh, Southern Illinois, Carbondale, Illinois. Southern Illinois University. Yeah, absolutely. That's where my father was on the, 
faculty. And um, then I went off to college, went to Harvard, majored in economics, um, and came down uh, to New York. And uh, I worked briefly for William S. Paley, the founder and chairman of CBS. That was a wonderful experience. And then I went to Fortune, and I've been at Fortune virtually my entire career. And how much do you do for CBS radio? Uh, I've been on CBS radio <laughs> for, what, 26 years now, um, doing, uh, you know, short reports um, that are carried on the CBS radio stations, wonderful stations all around the country, and I've been, so it, you know, the, these are small reports, like everything on talk radio these days, or news radio, it's short. Um, but I, I do a uh, couple of those every day. And Alan Sloan. I really am the polar opposite of Jeff. I, I didn't realize this. I grew up, I, I, or I was raised, it's not clear if I ever grew up, in Brooklyn, New York, which is not really like Vermillion. No, it's not. Um, I went to Brooklyn College because it was free. My father, may he rest in peace, worked primarily for nonprofit organizations. And what about mom? She she worked before they were married, and after my father, and she worked. She did business out of her home, or out of our home when when the kids were there. And that's by the way when I learned how to count and learned how to do all sorts of things because I helped her. It was cl very heavy clerical stuff, and I got to the point where I did everything in my head because that was so much faster because there were no calculators, and that's been of great help to me journalistically because I can do numbers in my head. And it's my many, secret weapon. How, how many years were you at Newsweek? Well, I was at Newsweek for 12 years, and I bounced around all over before that. I was in Charlotte uh, writing sports badly, then writing business. Then I was in Detroit for seven years, so all of our children, all three of them, have Michigan birth certificates. Then I ended up at Forbes a couple of times, and I've ended up here, and I've ended up there. Then I ended up at Newsweek, and I thought I'd be there forever, but of course that didn't quite work out. So five years ago, I went to Fortune. And again, I'm the polar opposite of Jeff. I've knocked around. I went to a public college. I was raised in a big city. And it, it's really sort of fun. Well, let's go back to this article. Uh, when did you first start talking to one another about this? How long ago? <laughs> it wasn't long ago, really, because, uh, I don't know, was, uh, was, we could look in the calendar, but there was some day in it August. Was, when it, we it, was had, the, it was the last Thursday in July. Last Thursday in July. Because I was going away for the month of August oh, on right, vacation, right, right. Right. and Thursday our boss Andy comes to me and says, you and Jeff are going to do this. And on that Friday, we, we, we had lunch. And we started working on the thing. Now, has there been, so far, uh, any reaction, strong reaction? And if there has been, what is it? Yeah. Well, we, we've had a tremendous amount of reaction. In fact, I can't recall getting a reaction, uh, anything like this one, in many, many years. We've just heard from a huge number of readers, most of whom were very laudatory. They said, thank heaven this needed to be said. Some of them, of course, didn't like the proposal, and we heard from them, too. But for the most part, what we've heard is from just lots and lots of readers. Have you, too? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where did you uh, have this picture taken that was in the, <laughs> in the magazine? Well, I, that was, I guess it's Crossing Sixth Avenue. Crossing Sixth Avenue. Oh, I'm sorry, right. Avenue of the Americas yeah. at 51st Street. Yes, now, that's now, exactly right. One, both of you have straw hats on. One has <laughs> a nice suit, tie, and you're dressed in your khakis and... Well, whatever else. Uh, does that say something? Well, it, it, w the first thing it says is that I had no idea they were ever going to take my picture because I was at the beach in a place called South Hold, New York, when this request comes to you know, have the picture taken. And I said, fine, send a car, pick mm -hmm. me up at the mm -hmm. beach, take me to my house in New Jersey so I can get a suit, and then take me to Fortune, and then take me back to the beach. And the answer comes, well we don't think we want you wearing a suit. Right. So I was trapped. <laughs> and my wife, who is a, a nice, rational, normal person, was mildly annoyed. But the only choice was the chambray shirt, because that was the best thing I had at the beach. So and, right. and, you know, and, at least one person reacted strongly. It was your wife who was irritated. No, but, but it is a nice picture. The picture came out very well. My, my outfit, well, you see, today I'm not wearing a chambray shirt. Right. Very uh, sharp. I, let, let me go back to this yeah. article <clears throat> before we run out of time. I, this is the one I labeled the sixth suggestion. Yes. The exclusion for employer-sponsored oh, yes. health insurance. Right. Millions right. of people have that. 
That's exactly right. And it is, as we said, I think, the weirdest tax expenditure, as the wonks say, in the whole tax code. It makes no sense. It's a hugely valuable benefit that everybody who gets health insurance at work receives. But unlike the other things you get at work, like your salary, it isn't taxed. You say it's $177 billion that, last year. That's how much it costs the, the, the treasury. The treasury. Uh, that's right, uh, in lost tax revenue because of that uh, provision in the tax code. And it, it's very unfair because it means that uh, health care benefits, uh, medical insurance, costs much more for people who don't have a job and have to buy it on their own than it costs for people who do have do a job. Do you buy this, Alan Sloan? Well, again, this is one, when, when Jeff put it on the table, I gulped. And I thought for a while, and I said, you know, as part of an overall deal, I can accept it. When, when McCain was running around suggesting this years ago, I criticized it. But as part of an overall package, I can accept it. The next one, though. <laughs> the next, you're right. The next one is the probably the one, hardest though, of them all. That's number seven on my list here. The tax deduction for mortgage interest. Well, yeah. I, I, again, left to my own devices, if, if I were in charge, I, I might not want to do that. But as part of an overall package, I think you have to do it. And it's the same thing as state and local taxes, which I live in a very high cost place very high tax. Housing prices are enormous. People's interest bills on mortgages are huge. We're talking about a lot of money. 105 billion, you say, yeah, last year. We're talking about a lot of money for a lot of friends of mine. Right. You, you know, this is not abstract. And normally, I would say, I don't want this. But again, as part of a package, right. I would and, take it. And, and that's critical, because we're not just saying eliminate the tax deduction for mortgage interest. We're saying eliminate it, but also we're going to lower tax rates overall. So it isn't immediately clear to a given person whether his tax would go up or down under this. It might be that they'd go down. And in any case, it just as a matter of logic, it makes no sense. How long have you felt that way? Oh, as I can't even remember. For many, many years, once you really focus on it and think about it, you realize there is no logical reason for that to be a tax deduction. And let's remember, you know, in other countries, such as Canada, they don't have a tax deduction for mortgage interest. And we might point out that Canada didn't have a housing bubble and a housing bust. Did, going back to the earlier one about health insurance, did you yeah. consider this whole business of exchanges in the state that are coming about because of the Affordable Care Act and that it would chase, I mean, business would drop insurance and chase their uh, yeah. employees to these exchanges? Yeah, I, I, again, I... I have a daughter who's a doctor. I, I know more about the health insurance business than I want to know and the, and the finances of it for reasons we won't go into. And I don't know how, and I had real problems w with the Obama thing where I thought it could have been done much simpler by just setting up some government company to compete with the insurance companies instead of trying to regulate the world. Uh, I mean, I don't understand the workings of the Affordable Care Act. I, I don't understand them. I don't think anybody understands them. And I don't know enough about it to have an informed opinion. So rather than say something completely stupid, I'll say nothing. <laughs> I, I think the point you're making, by the way, is all the more reason to end this tax break for people who get their insurance through work. Because just as you say, we, it's pretty certain that fewer and fewer people will get their insurance you through work. They're going to have to buy it on their own. And that, look, there is stuff in the Affordable Care Act to try to help those who have to buy it on their own and don't have all the, uh, and can't easily afford it. But we say, you know, let's make it across the board. Okay, go back to <clears throat> the mortgage interest. Yeah. I can, I can hear it. I'm, we're in New York. I can hear right. the lobbyists Right. All, all oh. those different companies that benefit from this yes. back in Washington. Yeah. Now, right now, I can hear them. They're yelling. Yeah, they're already us. yelling. Yeah. yeah, And and they're powerful. Well, yes, th they there are, are already limits on, on how much you can deduct. And, and I don't know if this made it into the Washington Post version, but in the Fortune version, we said it should be phased out over time, the deduction. Right. Right. So as, as not to disadvantage everybody who bought on the basis of, of this deduction, which I know when I first bought houses, I took, I, I calculated the deduction by figure, you know, to figure how much I could afford as a payment, right. and and you can't just change the rules and hang people up. 
because A, you'll cause them trouble, and B, they'll never get out of their houses financially alive, you know, because the price will drop. But if you phase this in and do it over time, it can be made to work, and there already are restrictions on how much interest you can deduct. It's in this piece. It said, you, you say basically here that it should be done over time. So, so yeah. you know, that answers the question. Over time. It's yeah. the only fair way to do it. it. The only fair way. By the way, we got a couple to go. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, was there any one of these that you got the most reaction about? Health Good insurance, question. mortgage, Social Security. I, I can't say that there was any one that we got the most re reaction to. So I think you've hit the, the ones you've touched so far are the hottest buttons for sure. Medicare is the hottest button. Um, the mortgage interest, yes. Some, and, oh, and by the way, later on we say... Um, you know, we should eliminate the deduction for charitable uh, That's next. charitable contributions. I'll read it. The, yeah. ta the tax deductions for state and local taxes and for charitable gifts. Right. Explain what that is if somebody hasn't ever thought right. about it. They just go to a tax preparer and all of a sudden... Well, well yeah. if you make out a check to your church or, or to your, the school where you went, to, where, where, where you went it, it can be, if you itemize your deductions, that's a deduction. So you you write a check to a religious organization or any sort of nonprofit or donate. Yeah, I mean all those contributions to universities would no longer be tax deductible. Yeah, the the two. Sure. You know, that's right. Well, again, we're talking. <laughs> stop looking at me like that. <laughs> you, you know, I'm giving. I'm just the, wondering how you survived the, this. Do you know, this, <clears throat> that's the only itemized deduction I get the benefit of anymore because I'm in the accursed alternative minimum tax, and that's the only clear deduction I have. But again. As part of an overall thing, I'd be willing to, you know, throw that in. And remember, my father worked for nonprofits. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, if he were still alive, he would kill me for even suggesting this. Right. But, you know, as Jeff said, there are real problems in this country, and we need to think about them differently than we thought. And, and again, this isn't something I like, but I'd hold my nose and accept it, just like I, I would on, on health care. And one of the things we proposed that you forgot to mention was eliminating the special treatment that invest income from investments get relative to income from work. And that's something Jeff had to swallow. Yeah. You, know, you yeah. swallow it all yeah. and, and you it, start it, out it, rationally. You're talking about capital gains? Yeah. Capital gains and dividends. And dividends. Yeah. It's only a, like a sentence or something <laughs> in the article, I think. It's, it's a fleeting mention. But tie that yeah. into this fiscal cliff. Yeah. That everybody, do you like that term, by the way? It's a perfectly good term, in my opinion. It, it, it makes it sound dramatic, and that's good, because it is dramatic. But part of that would be fiscal, the capital gains would go from 15 up to 20 if uh, right. the Bush tax cuts were, right. were allowed, to, were allowed expire. to expire. That's exactly what do you right. Think, based on watching Washington, what do you think will happen with the tax cut? Well, what I think will happen is a short-term solution will be adopted by the lame duck Congress. Uh, and it'll solve the problem so that the cliff doesn't happen. And if anybody, if there's still anybody who doesn't know what the cliff means, it means that taxes will go up on the 1st of January and a whole lot of government spending will be required to come down. A combination of higher taxes, lower government spending, a lot of people believe would tip the company or the country back into You think that's recession. a good idea to increase taxes? No, I don't. As you would expect from uh, somebody well, like me, I'm sure. I don't think it's a good idea. Um, so I think the, f the cliff will be averted, but in a very unsatisfactory, short-term way that does not help business make plans. And that's a large part of our financial What's problem. your guess? We've listened to President Obama all through the campaign say that the rich people ought to pay more. If he's reelected, what will happen? Because they, the one side or the other is going to have to cave. I suspect that if he's reelected, taxes will, will go up on upper income people. And by the way, his definition of rich includes me, which sends me into gales of laughter. You know, you know, because I'm not sure what rich means, but but he is. Um, I I think taxes that I pay should rise, but they should be more rational. I now actually pay not 15% on capital gains, if I ever had any, but I pay 22.5%. I pay Why? because of the crazy workings of the alternative minimum tax. And my accountant, with great glee, informed me once that something I'd written was wrong about what my tax rate was. 
And he told me I'm in the phase-out bracket of the alternative minimum tax, and if I only could get $150,000 more income, my tax rate would drop. Now, I presented this to our boss, Andy, who somehow was not sympathetic. But he I didn't want to give me the He didn't want to give me the 150. I'm sorry I'm such a, yeah. So not nice. I, I, but, you know, I don't understand. I've written about this stuff forever. I don't understand my own taxes. That's, I have to have an accountant. I can't understand the return when I get it. It's completely crazy. And you know what? 20% on capital gains isn't going to kill anybody. I, I mean, given my brothers, I treat capital gains and dividends the same way I treat income from work. But I would lower the rate on everything by broadening the base. What do you think? <clears throat> Excuse me, I can't get my throat clear. What do you think uh, will happen? And is it better? Is a country better off that everybody is elected from the same party, both the House, Senate, and the presidency, or are we yeah. better off having it? That's a <clears throat> real good question. In the current um, situation, I say we're better off with divided government. And the reason I say that is that when you get legislation that passes only because one party controls everything, it isn't stable. And the, the great example in this is the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare as some call it, which was enacted without a single Republican vote. Okay, it was enacted because the Democrats c controlled both houses of Congress plus of course the White House. Now the problem with that is business people who have to make plans look at that and say, okay, if it only passed because the Democrats had total control, then if after the election the Republicans have control, well, they've all promised to repeal it. Now, this is the largest ever regulation of the largest sector of the largest economy on the planet. Okay? The idea that it's either going to stand as the law of the land or, depending on the election results, could disappear completely is paralyzing for businesses in this country. It's so much better if we can have divided government and have them agree on something, which they may finally be forced to do. Did you have any trouble getting your editors at Fortune Magazine, which obviously appeals to people in business to accept this article? Uh, no. 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 I, no, I mean, no objections at all, I have to say. And, and, and I have to say I was surprised, but you know what? They basically, the, the boss trusts Jeff and me to have some idea of what we're, we're doing. And we just did this. And if you, you know, if you look over our, con if you think of our conversation we've had today, there is something in here to annoy everybody. That's right. And that was the whole point. Now, there's a last point that I want to ask you about uh, in the article. And that's what I, I said it was number nine on my list. But the biggest corporate tax expenditure by far is the deferral of tax on <laughs> well, income earned by multinationals yeah. abroad. Yep. Explain. How does it work? Uh, well, go ahead. All right. All right. Go ahead. The, the way it works, to the extent I understand it, is if you're, say, General Electric and you, you make money in Germany, you don't pay U.S. tax on those German profits until you bring the money back to the United States. And, you know, which again sounds like very rational and, and, and okay, but what's happened is things are so complicated now that companies invent, you know, big multinational companies who can afford to hire lawyers and accountants invent subsidiaries in other parts of the world, and Apple does this, and I think Google does it, and Cisco. Yeah. Yeah. They invent these subsidiaries where the, the profits are supposedly made in some tax haven where the company has nothing but a law firm right. and the the you know no one pay you know you don't pay any tax um and i think that, it, that this is the only thing that jeff and i could not reconcile and i think that if you adopt the idea that you can continue to defer taxes earned overseas that no american company will ever report earning a penny in the united states because they'll set up all of this crazy stuff yeah, well, and the further problem, as Alan suggests, is if they would pay U.S. taxes if they brought the money back into the United States, and the U.S. tax rate is on corporate profits is the highest in the world, uh, then they don't bring the money back into the United States. And so they are constantly being accused of doing all their investing and hiring and so forth in other countries. Well, part of the reason, it's certainly not the only reason, but part of the reason is that they are hugely disincentivized 
to bring that money back into the U.S. It's funny, we both agree that the current system is nutty. Um, the question is how to fix it, and we have different views on that, which get to be somewhat technical, but uh, we've got a bad situation the way it is now. Uh, I know that this was not meant to be a political article, but let me ask you this as kind of a guide to people that are trying to figure out who to vote for. Yeah. Will it make a difference? Well, what? In your opinion, Absolutely. and what will that difference be if you elect Mitt Romney or Barack Obama? What's a, what's a definite difference? When, and about the, in, in relationship to this conversation we've been having. I mean, I'm not going to go. I'm, I'm just not going to go there. I, I, need to, <laughs> I don't I, mean I, right I, or wrong. I mean, I, mean yeah. I, I need to live. Also tell me who will be in the Senate, who will be in the House. You'll tell me all of these things. That's why I asked that question. Because okay. I don't think, as, we, as we've discussed this election, nobody ever factors in the House and the Senate. They always talk about the president. Right. Well, well right. I, and I don't. In fact, you know, I, I'm working on something about how little power the president actually has compared to what people think the president has. It, it's... It's really not a question of who wins. It's a question of whether people grow up. And maybe they'll grow up because they know they should grow up. And both parties will, re you know, not to get into a fight with Jeff, will restrain the zealots and grow up and act but, but, like grown-ups. It has nothing to, to do with who wins or loses. It has to do with behavior. Voters also in that growing up? No, the voters, you know, voters are going to elect these guys, the, the guys, or, or the people, excuse me. The people are the ones who are going to do this. The voters don't do it. The, the people do it. The, yeah, the, the elected, the, are, the elected are officials the do it. people saying to these elected officials, this is what we want you to do, you know? Yeah, yeah uh, there is a, a, a large element of that, I fear. And we do want some of the, definitely some of the voters to grow up uh, as well and just realize that someone who's willing to go to Washington and compromise is actually what we need. Now, when you ask what's going to be different depending on who wins, well, one thing we can say for sure, and it may be the only thing, is if the Republicans sweep, which seems highly unlikely at this point, but if they sweep White House, Senate, House of Representatives, then apparently Obamacare would be repealed because Mitt Romney and the leaders of both houses in, on the Republican side have pledged that they would do that. And if the Republicans sweep, they'd have the votes, and they could do it. So presumably that would happen. Beyond that, all we can say with regard to the presidential election is, what would change is what is proposed by the president to the Senate. But, in, and that certainly shifts the direction of the debate. But what can actually get enacted, assuming we have divided government, which I do believe is the likeliest outcome, uh, I, I wouldn't even venture to guess. If I could violate Amity for a second, yes, I think even if what you say happens, unless the Republicans have 60 votes in the Senate. That may well be. If it, they don't right. have 60 votes right. in the Senate, right. the Democrats are going to we'll, act we'll like Republicans. Stop. Right, and just and, stop. and you won't repeal right. Obamacare. Right. It, yeah. it won't happen. You'll be. have gridlock in the other direction. Yeah. Um, because now it's no longer, well, the other people will, will, you know, have the majority. We need to respect them. It's what can we get? What can we extort? I, I mean, the whole system is just nuts. Let me <clears throat> ask you both about a tax. It doesn't seem to get much discussion in the Affordable Care Act. There's a 3.8% increase in tax right. over 200000 on a single or 250000 on a couple. There's an additional 0.9% on your Medicare tax. Right. W when does that... And then we're getting into the numbers. But yeah. when does that, 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 if you combine this, almost 5% increase without the uh, uh, re uh, reversing yeah. of the Bush tax cuts? Yeah, it's a substantial tax yeah. increase. Yeah. And uh, it for, would. For people like us who have substantial incomes. Right. And yeah. the part of that that I, and here, you know, I am a tax cutter, but the part yeah. of that that I would endorse actually is the increase in the um, Medicare tax. All right. It's unpleasant and it's unpalatable. But something uh, that's sort of step one in getting Medicare under control. When does control. that attack? Well, it, going ahead in the near future without changing anything with the, act, the Health Act being passed, what will people, the average person, pay for their Medicare tax a month for how long? And when do you get the 0.9% added? I think that that's next year, isn't it? Uh, I'm not. You know, it's a good question. Is it, next year? Is it added after yeah. the 125,000 or after uh, the 200,000? Uh, yeah. I think it's added after 
200 or 250. I'm just not sure. I, I just don't know the workings. Because right now, the Medicare tax is, what, 145? Uh, I think it's 1.45 percent. On all salary on, income. On all your, your salary income. Right. So it would go to, what, 2.35? Something like I that. I think that's can, right. Can yeah. Either one of you explain it. Both sides talk about this $700 billion savings <laughs> in health yeah. care. Right. And, but wh who's right? Right. The problem, though, the, the, you can see that we both become just incredibly uh, frustrated by this. It has to do with the way these things are talked about in Washington, which has nothing to do with the way real people talk about real money in their real lives. So in other words, the current projection is that Medicare spending would increase by X hundreds of billions of dollars over the next um, 10 years. And so the uh, Obama plan said they would bring that figure down. They would bring the growth down by $700 billion. Now, only in Washington is that called a cut, all right? The, the amount spent would still be more than is being spent today, but it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be as much more as previously forecast. And, and there's also no guarantee <laughs> that the cut would ever actually happen. It's just a projection. That's right. So it's you're just having an argument. So the Obama people, to make the Affordable Care Act look better, say, here's all this money the Congressional Budget Office says we'll save. Right. And it's not that they're proposing to cut Medicare. They're just saying the things we've done will cut it. And they, they say, it, who we'll, knows? We'll spend, who knows if that's true? Right. That what they're saying is we will spend less than we believe we would have spent otherwise, but it's still going to be more than we're spending today. Okay. And people's eyes glaze. The minute, I mean, this is why you can't talk. It's one reason you can't talk about this issue. People's eyes glaze over. Understandably so. The graphic in the Washington Post, we're about out of time, shows shows the uh, elephant and the donkey back to back there right. in, the, in the ring. In diapers in a sandbox, because they're being little kids. What item did not go in your article because you couldn't agree on it? No, no, that's a good question. I don't know no, if there was one. Nothing. Because uh, we didn't agree on the corporate tax reform, and we just said we can't agree on it. Um, and I think that was it. Now, if we tried to get more detailed, then who knows, right? We don't have a staff, and we didn't have 500 pages, so uh, we didn't get very detailed. And that's where we might have disagreed. But as it is, I don't think Alan we did. Alan Sloan, if you were uh, running for office, would you say all this? Yeah. And it's one of the reasons I'd never yeah, win. Yeah, you'd, you'd lose. But, I, of course, but, of course so I, would I. Of course I would say all yeah. of this. I, I, I'm not going to say something in public. Yeah, but what does this really say, though, about, I mean, you, you've both have alluded to the fact that a lot of people running believe this has to happen one way or the other. What does it say about our system? It says that people on all sides of the political thing pander and aren't telling people the truth because they think people aren't ready for the truth, and if they tell people the truth, they aren't going to win. It's a problem in the culture. Fundamentally, that's what it is. Uh, you can't fix this with a law. It's a problem in the culture that, w w you know, that compromise is now a synonym for treason. You close this article by writing, as the economy cries out for help, for adult supervision at last, just maybe the moment has arrived. Yeah. What chance do you give it on a percentage basis that the moment has arrived? Uh, I'll tell you, for the, the chance that we're going to get big, long-term, big-picture reform in the next Congress, the next two years, 20%. What's the right way to pronounce your last name? Colvin. Colvin. Jeff Colvin. Thank you. Uh, Colvin of Fortune Magazine. Alan Sloan, what are the chances, in your opinion, that we're going to get the, the, this moment has arrived? Again. Jeff has thought about this more than I have. I'll, I'll take his number. I'm, I'm, see, I'm a good guy. I can't promise. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever heard that. Oh, no, you're talking about yourself. <laughs> Alan Sloan and Jeff Colvin, thank you very much. People can find your article on the C-SPAN website, but they can go to Fortune Magazine or the Washington Post. And this was published in early September. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Brian. Our pleasure. Thank you. You can read the Fortune article by going to money.cnn.com slash magazines slash fortune. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, 
visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.